Thank you everybody for joining us. We're going to start our lovely event tonight. So get ready, get your drink and settle in. Welcome to Don't Ask by Gina Reutemann in conversation with Tommy Schnurmacher. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dylan Curran from Guernica Edition's publicity and marketing team. And for, night, I will, for tonight, I will be your host. As we gather in this virtual space, we acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples, many of whom have been forced to leave for other lands. We would like to acknowledge the peoples who were the first to live, celebrate, lament, and sing upon the land where we now sit. Guernica Editions is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, huron wendat Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to care and share for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We'd also like to gratefully acknowledge the financial assistance of the Canada Council of the Arts through the Writers' Union of Canada. Now a little bit of housekeeping before we turn to the main event. So please note that this is a Zoom webinar feature with closed captioning available. A recording will also be published later this week on Guernica Edition's YouTube channel for anyone unable to attend tonight. For those of you joining us from Facebook, feel free to hit the share button or leave a comment. Please keep in mind that as a webinar feature, your video and mic are not enabled, which is why you won't be able to see yourself displayed alongside our panelists. But not to worry, if you have questions or comments for our guests, you're welcome to drop them in the Q&A chat below. You can test it out now by letting us know where you're joining us from. It's always really interesting seeing where people are coming together from in this virtual space. For those of you interested in purchasing a copy of Don't Ask, I'll leave a link in the chat um, the book is also available at your local bookshop, Indigo, Barnes & Noble, Waterstones, and Amazon. We encourage you to borrow it from your, from your local library, and if possible, you can leave reviews on platforms like Goodreads. From wherever you're joining us, thank you for supporting Canadian creatives and their books. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tommy Schnurmacher to the virtual stage. Tommy is a Canadian author, journalist, broadcaster, and raconteur. He was the host of a highly rated three-hour open line talk show on CJAD Radio in Montreal for more than 20 years. Winner of the Golden Ribbon Award presented by the Canadian Association of Broadcasters, he was shortlisted for the 2021 Whistler Independent Book Award for his memoir, Makeup Tips from Auschwitz, How Vanity Saved My Mother's Life. Tommy is on the board of directors of the Foundation for Genocide Education in Montreal. Tommy spent an entire week with John Lennon and Yoko Ono at the Bed Inn for Peace. He covered the Academy Awards more than a dozen times and is still proud that Oscar-winning actress Meryl Streep once stepped on his foot in the lobby of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Here he is to introduce Gina Reutemann. Over to you, Tommy. Thank you very much, uh, Dylan. It's a pleasure to be chatting with Gina Reutemann today. And now you obviously expect to hear something like that from the guy who's hosting the conversation. But in this case, uh, I really mean it and I have proof. When Gina and I were both in the radio industry on a semi-regular basis, one of the high points of my day would be to drop by her office on Mountain Street in downtown Montreal and sit in the chair right next to her desk and chat away. I love having conversations with Gina, and that's precisely what we are going to do in a few moments. But let me tell you a few things about uh, Gina. She's uh, an author, a short story writer, a biographer, a memoir writing coach, a former penguin herder, but that's another story. Uh, her newly released uh, literary novel is Don't Ask. Other works include a critically acclaimed collection of nine linked stories, Tell Me Story, Tell Me the Truth, and a biography with Gary Bromberg, Midway to China and Beyond. Her essays and short stories have aired on CBC Radio and recently appeared in Moment Magazine, uh, her, uh, as well as in several anthologies, including the new Spice Box, Wherever I Find Myself, Navigating Bipolar Country and Immigration Stories. Her poetry has also been featured in several publications, including Poetica and The Undead. 
Her proudest poetic achievement was a commission to write a poem to accompany an original musical composition premiered at the Pink Triangle Project in San Francisco, and she performed Der Hundert Fundfund Zipziger, I think I did that pretty well under the circumstances, at the concert event in 2011. She's got a film credit uh, as well, 2013 with Jane Houghton as executive producer and director. Gina co-produced and appeared in the award-winning documentary film, My Mother, The Nazi Midwife and Me. This film was about Gina's return to the German town where she was born to learn how her mother saved her life years after World War II. Upon its release, this film aired on CBC's Doc Channel for two years. Currently, Gina working on two projects, editing an anthology of stories by 14 daughters of Holocaust survivors, all members of a memoir writing workshop that Gina has been leading for some four years via Zoom, and a novel about the early 20th century painter Chaim Soutin, called by many the father of abstract expressionism. Oh, one other thing. She's also a dear friend who I have known for several decades. But before we start our conversation, I'd like to invite Gina to give us a brief reading from her new novel, Don't Ask. Now you'll just have to here. unmute for a moment. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Dylan. And I will read. Now you can hear me. This is from the, uh, the opening of Don't Ask, the first chapter. <clears throat> she was running late. Punctuality was one of her mother's main, many obsessions. But Hannah, afflicted by an elastic sense of time, had never mastered Ruchel's rule. She remembered well one of the first notes Ruchel had written in what eventually became their common mode of communication. It had read, when there was roll call in Auschwitz, late one minute meant dead the next. Hannah shouldn't have taken that last phone call, but the client had insisted he needed to speak to her immediately. Her best friend, Marilyn, maintained that Hannah was incapable of saying no to anyone who claimed to need her. You're a real estate agent, Hannah, a real estate agent, not a brain surgeon. Friends since childhood, Marilyn had an annoying way of repeating certain phrases for emphasis. Nobody will die if you don't respond immediately. Nobody. If she hadn't taken the call, maybe she wouldn't be stuck in the stifling August heat, chewing on her cuticles and endlessly replaying the fight she and her mother had had the night before. It had left Hannah deeply shaken. Open disagreement between them was as rare as motherly hugs. Long ago, Hannah had recognized that her mother wore silence as protective gear against the world. Sometimes that silence was a body shield, sometimes a sound barrier to force Hannah into silence as well. Last night, however, Ruffel had raised her voice for the first time in Hannah's memory. The transformation in the woman who did nothing out of character for all of Hannah's 45 years had left her shaken. When she was a child, Hannah had believed that Ruchel's voice was impaired, that it was physically unable to project above a certain soft range, and that using it too often was painful for Ruchel. But last night, her mother gave lie to that with a keening wail not heard, even upon the death of Hannah's father, Barak. It grew like a siren, gathering strength and turned into a shrill, high-pitched harangue. It demanded that Hannah must not, under any circumstances, ever travel to Germany. Stunned by her mother's new faculty for making herself heard, Hannah hastily made a promise. This morning, however, she was uncertain whether she could keep it. On her way to pick up Ruchel for a doctor's appointment, traffic had crept at a maddeningly slow pace. It was almost as if unseen forces were aware of Hannah's reluctance to face her mother. In an effort to drown out a replay of the previous night's scene, Hannah turned on the radio and was not surprised that there had been an accident. Likely everyone was taking their turn gawking at the disaster. What was this human compulsion, Hannah wondered, to bear witness to the misfortune of others? It was as if by surveying a calamity, people imagined that they could protect themselves from it. For her, it was a point of honor never to look. Finally able to head off the expressway, Hannah accelerated down Barclay, imagining Rochel sitting in the front hall, twisting the tissue and staring balefully at the door. 
She pulled into the driveway of what she still thought of as her father's house, house, although Barak had been dead for two years. The stop was so abrupt, her tires squealed, the screech tracing a shiver down Hannah's sweaty spine. But when she opened the car door, a blast of August heat momentarily knocked her back into the cool interior. Recovering her nerve, she hurried and she hurried up the crumbling concrete steps of the duplex, her spiked heel catching in a crack as it, done, as, as it had done so many times before. Nanoseconds before her knee made contact with the cement, she managed to regain her balance. Saved, she thought, although a battered knee was preferable to the bruised look she knew was on her mother's face when she walked into the house. Hannah peered through the curtained window of the door, then fumbled the key into the lock. Click. Click. That was the sound the bold mate went sliding shut. The door was open. Hannah's brain was working hard to compute the information. Rochel's door was always locked. The August heat pressed against Hannah's back, her blouse clinging to her like a frightened child. She leaned her forehead on the wood for a moment, turned the key again and pushed the door open, entering the cool of the tiny vestibule. The old flowered wallpaper exhaled its familiar dusty odor with a slight hint of mold. Since her father's death, her parents' home seemed to be decaying more rapidly. Ma, she called out, entering the damp gloom. Rojo, the voice rustled through the flat. Sweat mushroomed on Hannah's upper lip as her eyes darted into the dim hallway. Ma, she called again, heading for the kitchen. If Rojo had left in a fury without her, there would be a note. But after checking all the familiar places, the front of the fridge, the tray under Rochel's myriad of medications, the utility drawer with a carefully separated rubber bands, twist ties, and ball of string. Each time, Hannah came up empty. What is the matter with you? Her father's voice echoed in the still air of the hallway. You are our only child, the only family your mother has left. You are supposed to watch over and care for her. What she lived through in her life, you'll never know. Don't ask but know you are all she has. Promise me you will watch over Ruchel when I'm gone. Promise me. How many times had Barak hammered those words into her head, especially in the final stages of his cancer? Hannah reasoned that Ruchel must have left in a panic over being late for her appointment. If anything happened to her mother, it was Hannah's fault. She should have been on time. But where is the note? Hannah took a tissue from her purse and dabbed at her brow and upper lip. The house was stifling hot despite the semi-gloom, but she forced herself to calm down and think. Ruchel had taken the bus to get to the doctor's appointment, the taxi beam, a reserved strictly for life or death matters. She would still have left a note. There was always a note. Hannah went back into the hall, uncertain she stood a moment scanning the uniformly beige walls for some inspiration. The decor in the duplex was sparse. A few cast off prints from Hannah's first apartment were, uh, were a sad attempt to introduce some color, but what still dominated was a family photo. It had been taken in the studio on Park Avenue when she was four. In it, Barack stands relaxed in an impeccable pinstripe suit. Hannah is in a white blouse, a box pleat skirt, and a white satin bow almost lost in the sea of dense copper curls. And Russell is also in a white blouse, buttoned to the neck, in a dark fitted jacket that showed off her tiny waist. Although facing forward, Rochel isn't looking into the camera. Instead, her eyes are locked on her husband with an expression Hannah was never able to interpret. Positioned between the two of them, Hannah had been made to sit on a stool but appeared to be straining forward as if ready to bolt. She had refused to smile despite the photographer's best efforts to cajole one out of her. Frustrated, Hannah sat down on the wrought iron telephone table with its old black rotary dial phone. Rahul would not hear of replacing it, saying that it was still perfectly good. Eventually, Hannah had stopped trying to get her to change her mind. She lifted the receiver and called the doctor's office, waiting impatiently for each turn of the rotary dial to be completed. Hi, Betty, Hannah said when Dr. Rubin's nurse finally answered. I'm sorry to trouble you, but in, is my mother there? No, and I was getting concerned, Betty said. You guys are always so punctual. Is there anything wrong? No, no, of course not. I, I got caught at the office and I, I think my mother lost patience waiting for me. She'll probably show up any minute. Would you mind having her call me when she does? 
Sure, sure, Betty said, already on another task. Okay, bye. Bye, Hannah said to the dial tone. She raked her nails through her thick hair and examined the copper strands that came back laced between her fingers. When she was young, Grochel used to whistle a high bird-like trill as she brushed her daughter's hair until it shone like a bright penny. As if mesmerized, Hannah would watch the arc of her mother's arm complete a slow downward stroke. The movement carried out in the same precise way each time. Rochel's pale skin was so delicate except for the scar on her forearm, a lumpy welt of red and blue, like the tiny tableau of a mountain range. Rochel's whistling as she gently ministered to her daughter's tangled mass, a silken thread of intimacy binding their daily lives in a way that comforted young Hannah. Balefully stuffing the loose strands of her hair into her pocket, Hannah absentmindedly opened the hall closet and was momentarily confused when she spied Rochel's purse. She reached in and turned it over slowly as if to reassure herself she wasn't mistaken. It was a bag she knew well with all its little zippered compartments because it had belonged to her, earmarked for the Pioneer Women's Annual Bazaar until Rochel snatched it from the pile. Her mother could not bear to throw anything out, a habit that she had transmitted to her daughter. In a corner of Hannah's cedar closet, four shoe boxes, one for each decade, and a fresh one marked 2000, printed in heavy black marker on the end of each box, contained Rochel's notes neatly stacked. Like the dream log she'd been keeping since her teens, Hannah planned to one day read them all at once when she had to. Ignoring the hammering of her heart, Hannah unzippered the main compartment. Her mother's wallet, which had once been hers, lay next to a crumpled cotton handkerchief with a faded embroidered rose on the edge and an old black comb. In the front compartment, Hannah found a scrap of paper. On it was Ruchel's meticulous script. Her hands trembled as she pulled this note out of the bag and laid it in her lap. On the day her mother disappeared, Hannah read the last note Ruchel would leave her. I am not her, it said. Thank you very much, uh, Gina. Uh, uh, the the novel, the title, Don't Ask, is a, a great title and it's a great literary thriller. Take us back to the time you first thought of writing this novel. Um, it, it, I suppose it goes back to the fact that my mother could not stop telling her stories and she told them over and over again to the point where I didn't want to hear them. So I stopped asking questions at a very early age. Then, of course, as I grew older, I'd lost my mother when I was 28. Suddenly, I had a million questions, but no one to ask because we had no family left. And so I, I, I thought, what would it be like if you had a mother who never told her stories? And what if you were a daughter who had wanted to ask questions but was afraid to open festering wounds or, or, or end up being responsible? For, for sorrow that was inconsolable, unconsolable. So that's, that's, where, that's where it began. But when I wrote the words, I am not her, that really was the beginning of the novel for me. And I, I don't know where it came from, but it just, everything sort of uh, flowed from those words. How long did it take to write? Forever <laughs> it took me. I started. I started researching it in 2004, and in 2005, um, I went to Germany to do the research and ended up being in a documentary. Because when I told my friend Jane Houghton, who was a television producer and personality, um, that I in January of 2005, I told her I was going to Germany in May for the 60th anniversary of the end of the war, she, when she heard my story, she says, you, 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 you found out about this, this Nazi midwife, you know, this is a documentary. And I said, really? Okay. And she said, I'll, I'll, I'll get cameramen, I'll get it financed, whatever. We went without financing and um, eight years later, we finally had documentary, but I had shelved my, my, <laughs> my story, waiting to finish the documentary. So 
it had a hiatus, but it, it was an important time because it sort of percolated. Tell me about uh, that first trip to Germany. You're going to Germany, uh, you're going there to do uh, research. Uh, do you recall the, the first day, the first day you arrived, your, your thought process being in Germany, knowing what your mother had gone through? Um, the first time I went to Germany was an accident. I was in Frankfurt um, getting a plane to Nice. And I, I, I had I'd been diverted and I, was, I arrived in, in Frankfurt and I had twisted my ankle. So they were very kind on Lufthansa and they took very good care of me. And they had me on the, one of these you know, wagons that go through the, uh, these little buses that take you from one gate to another. And as I was going through the, uh, the airport in Frankfurt, I, it was very early in the morning. And the first thing that, I, that caught my eye was a Hasidic Jew with his tefillin and his talus praying. And I, 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 like, it was such a disconcerting sight that after that I had to rethink everything I understood about Germany. What, what did you think of before and after you saw this Hasidic Jew praying at the well, airport? Before I had been raised to, to, you know, I didn't buy into it, but I'd been raised to, to despise Germany and Germans for, for the losses of my father's wife and, and three children, for my mother's five sisters, her husband, her son. So, you know, it was always about loss and, uh, and about rejection. And here there was something that was so, so startling in, in its juxtaposition with what I understood of Germany, that I had to start from the beginning, I had to go to ground zero. Now, the, the protagonist uh, in the novel, Hannah Baran, is a successful real estate agent with a very special relationship with her mother. Tell us a, a bit about that, the relationship between the protagonist and her mom. Well, Hannah uh, is a is was is raised with longing for all the things that she sees other children have that she doesn't have. She doesn't have a mother who bakes and 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 and, and uh, uh, you know comforts her if she's uh, if she's scraped her knee. She doesn't have a mother who tells her stories. She has a father who's very. Um, gregarious and, and, and uh, um, somewhat argumentative. Um, he's, a, he's a unionist and, you know, he works in a schmata factory and, the, and this isn't what he wanted in his life, but this is what he, you know, he'll do to, to keep his family together. But her mother is, is so remote, is, so, you know, is, um, and all she, the only way she can help Hannah navigate her, her childhood is by sending her little notes um, when she least expects it. So when Barack tells Hannah she can't, have, she can't wear makeup and she wants to wear makeup like her friend Marilyn is wearing makeup, her mother wraps her, her sandwich for school in wax paper. And on the wax paper writes a note when you wear too much makeup, your face will end up looking like this, which is, of course, all wrinkled. So in her own way, she, she's, she's trying to do the right thing, but Rochel is severely damaged. And um, she was damaged from an early age before the war. Uh, she was damaged by, and it's, it's this history, this, this business of carrying carrying the baggage from generations. Each generation passes it on to the next. And that was what I, I wanted to explore in the relationship between Hannah and Rufa. As, a, as children of Holocaust survivors, we often tend to be uh, overprotective of uh, our parents. How would you say that being a child of survivors has impacted your life? I don't know, it's the only life I've had. <laughs> so, I think that, I, think that uh, I had no intention 
of being on this path. When I finally started writing in my mid 40s, this was not the stories that I was planning. These were not the stories I was planning to tell. But these were the stories that had been buried in me. They were like seeds that, you know, or, or, or those frogs that only come out when the rain comes. <laughs> it's just like, it sort of sprung out of nowhere. And so I, I, you know, I had once said, I think on my, it was on my first visit to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It was just opened about a year. And a friend of mine had taken me there. And at the end of it, I, I I was very moved by everything I saw, but what I said was, I don't want to spend the rest of my life carrying my parents' history with me like Marley's chains, dragging it behind me. And yet, this is precisely all I do. So it doesn't matter what you want, it's what, what you're driven to do. The stories tell themselves. Uh, my brother, who's younger than I am by three and a half years, and who never got any of these stories, when he started reading them, he, he said to me one day, are you ever going to write about anything else? And the answer is no, I guess not. What is your daily writing regimen? <laughs> um, sporadic, very sporadic. I, um, I, I have to be moved to write. Or I have to have a deadline, uh, and that comes right. from years of working in in an industry where deadlines were everything. Um, it's why I have uh, such a marvelous group of friends who are um, who are also writers, and and we're in a writing group together, and they encourage me. I have writing friends, so they they spur me on, and sometimes even. Uh, Elise, give me ideas, you know, as to what I should be writing about or what I could be writing about. But I, I'm not, I'm not a very disciplined person. I get a lot done, but I don't know how I do it, quite honestly. How do you deal with writer's block? I'm sorry? How do you deal with writer's block? I've never had writer's block. That's very okay. That that's uh, terrific. But I have I, this I, I, procrastination. That's not writer's block. I no, just no. I've never. I, I've never. If I sit down to write, if I'm moved, I will write. And and sometimes I can write big swaths, and sometimes I, you know, I just uh, and half of it's in my head, and half of it's on the page, and that's that's why you need writers groups to help you to remind you. What did you mean by this? I don't get it. <laughs> so, right. yeah, I think you need to, uh, you know, if you write sporadic, I think sometimes you miss the the uh, the inspiration that comes. It was, I, I, it was hard for me to do, but I did it. As I sit down, even if I'm not in the mood, and write, oh, this is terrible, this is terrible, this is terrible, over and over again, and then something will come to you. But it's it's a I sometimes enjoy the discipline, even though it's hard to get into it now. Dorothy Parker once said, I hate writing. I love having written. Do you feel that way sometimes? Oh, all the time. <laughs> Except I'm, I, I can't stop editing. Even, even just, you know, having, uh, reading the first chapter, I would have rewritten that again, you know, given the opportunity. Um, but I, I think that there's, um, it, 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 when she, the, the best part for me has been when I'm not at home. Uh, when uh, I've written most of this in Spain, and uh, the, the book I'm working on now, I've written more of it in Spain than I've written in here because I'm I'm totally disconnected from everything, and I've got six hours on the rest of the world because I'm in Europe. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a good feeling. What was the? What was the toughest part of writing Don't Ask? Uh, keeping track of the, <laughs> one part of, one of the toughest parts was keeping track of all the different plot lines that I had. And I, and because I keep going over and over rewriting, sometimes you tend to, to repeat, you know, 
the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think I must have written three or four times that I have that Hannah had an elastic sense of time and it's only so it's keeping track of what you've written. But the other part is when you when you write yourself into a corner and you you know, especially when you're you're writing something that has twists and turns, as I am want to do. Um, I, I I would write myself into a corner and go, how the hell am I going to get out of this? And then the next day, I go, ah, <laughs> and it, it you know it becomes obvious, but it's it, you can't force it. You know, once you're in the corner, you just have to back up a little bit and give time, and you'll come up with your answer. Are you satisfied with the first answers you come up with? Um, never. If they, if I think they work, yes. But then I have to, I have to get a consensus, and that's again why a writing group is so valuable. You know that that you you think that you've done something magical, and then then everybody brings you back to earth, and you go, wait a minute, <laughs> okay. I asked you before, what was the the uh, the hardest part of writing? What's the easiest part? The fun part. The fun part is telling the story how it's going to be. You know, uh, talking about it is is much more fun than actually sitting down and writing about it. So I think that's that's my failing. That's not necessarily a positive because when you're busy talking about it, you're not doing it. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I was on um, CBC television with Kathy Kiefler and she was working on a book and I asked her about it and she refused to say one word about it to me. She wouldn't tell me anything about it at all. And I said, why not? She says, every moment you spend talking about your project, you're gonna be less interested in the project because you've already said that. You've already told five or six people how interesting this is and then when you get down to write it you don't feel like doing it anymore i took that advice that you know because uh, i think it was pretty wise piece of advice it doesn't necessarily work for everybody for me talking about it forces me to do it because uh -huh. now i told everybody i'm going to do it i have to actually do it as as i started reading uh don't ask i got to the part where she gets uh to, to her mother ruffles place and her mother is not there and i could instantly feel the the terror that i recall whenever i'd call my mother and she wouldn't answer after the first few rings uh did you ever have that sense of fear growing up oh, oh my god what if something happens to my mother uh, i don't think so because my mother was so incredibly resourceful um and she was always so much more afraid for me that I, it never occurred to me to be afraid for her. And the only time that I, I realized what terror she had, there's, there, there's something that I use in, uh, in the story about how Rucho forces Hannah to pull over whenever she hears a siren, no matter how far away it is, no matter what kind of siren it is, because that's, you have to, you, you, you don't want to you, you don't want to be moving appearing to be running and my mother that was my mother she, she was incredibly um, skilled at, at, at taking care of things she learned how to drive a car because my father couldn't uh, he, he it was too big he was a tailor and the biggest machine he could handle was a sewing machine the car was out of the question but and she had that. She had this uh, unbelievable fear of the unknown, that because she had been through so much, and she had overcome it. But she knew that you could never, you could never know what is going to happen, and not knowing what was going to happen was the fear. So, as much as she wanted to control everything. Um, she realized she was never in control. The other thing was that um, my father went to, to Israel um, to, to visit with his sister for the first time. And my mother was alone in the house and she was afraid to be alone in the house. And that was something that absolutely amazed me. And that's when I started to call every day. 
Yeah, it, it, it's interesting that we have that in common. I, I remember we once rented a, a house uh, in Valmorin for, for the summer, for six weeks in the summer. And uh, we'd go for walks, we'd go to the beach, etc. And in the evening when we would come home, uh, what mom would do would be, because uh, it was it had several bedrooms, this place uh, that we'd rented, even though it was just the two of us there. She would go into each room, of course, to check under the bed. What are you doing? She's checking to see if there are any murderers uh, under the, the bed. So at, at, at age 10, I was reassured that every night that there would be no murderers before we went to sleep because mom had, had looked for that. Now, um, in terms of mothers, strange things that mothers uh, do, some Holocaust survivors talk a lot about their experiences, as, as you mentioned, your mother talked about it. Others don't say uh, a, a word about it. Right now, when you look back to what your mother told you when you were younger, of all the things that she told you, what stands out? What what hit you or, or bothered you or hit you in a certain way? Well, what she had told me was that she, because she was the middle of six sisters, she told me that she was the practical one. She wasn't the prettiest. She wasn't the one who who who, who married well. She wasn't the one who was the smartest. She was the practical one, the one who made sure that there was always a, a chicken in the pot for Shabbos. And she, she had this expression, if my mother, she, she would say, if my mother would see what had become of me, if she would rise out of the grave to see it, she would fall right back in from the shock. Because she, she painted this picture of herself as being someone who was um, not as accomplished as my mother was. She spoke six languages. She ran my father's business. She drove a car. She, you know, she ran a household. She rubbed two pennies together and made a dollar. She was a remarkable woman. When I met her friends in Israel when I was 18, and they started to tell me stories about who my mother was, and, you know, um, it, it was a very different story. She'd always been who she was. She just didn't remember herself that way. We all change our histories. So um, that was that was finding out that she was not the woman she thought she was. Uh, that was that was uh, probably the biggest shock came years after she died. And my mother was from a town called Chanov, and there was a, a yard side book that um, my, her cousin had had, uh, who lived in New Jersey and gave to me. And I saw a picture of uh, Hashemir Hatzir. And in that picture, there was a crowd of people and they're all standing a big old outside somewhere in, the, uh, in, in a, a wood. And in the center, there was this one woman, nobody was near her. It was my mother at the age of 20. She was in charge. That's not how she remembered herself. What what legacy uh, do you feel you received from your mother? Toughness and a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she she was she never gave up, and um, I, you know I, I think of myself sometimes as a bull in a china shop. You know, I just I just got roaring through to do what I have to do, and and um, that's not always a smart way to to approach life, but it's it's my legacy. Um, I'm also she was also a very practical person, and she had a lot of good common sense, and so I think I inherited that from her. I hope I did anyway, and. No, what was the question? The legacy, the legacy you received from your mom. Common sense and big boobs. Yeah, and common sense was pretty uncommon. When you look around, what is it on, on a daily basis that gives you hope about the future? That I'm alive. Uh, <laughs> Axel, my partner, has, uh, uh, you know, his theory is every day above ground is a good day until somebody asked how long had he been a subway driver. <laughs> so, but 
I, I'm just, you know, I'm here. I, my mother died. She was 63. I'm 74. I'm, you know, I'm beating the odds. Um, I would, I could have died, uh, a, you know, a week into my life, but she made sure that I didn't. So I owe her that much just to keep going, keep telling the stories. I know, I know that's that's a separate story. It's not the novel. The story of the could you just briefly tell us about the story of the of the German uh, midwife? What your mother told you about the German midwife? So every every year of my birthday, my mother would wake me up with a story about how she'd saved my life because she wouldn't allow me to be born in the DP camp called Plocking Waldstadt. Um, instead, I was born in Passau, the nearby town, because. Uh, she had heard that there was, you know, a doctor and it, there were too many babies dying. And I interpreted this birthday wish as you should be grateful that I saved your life and thank me every single day. And mm -hmm. we, we had a very conflictual relationship from an early age, from my early age. Um, she died when I was 28. The story stopped. And then... Um, I met someone that I saw the, the film uh, with Anna Rasp, about Anna Rasp, was called The Nasty Girl, who was born in Passa and who fought her town to prove that they had not been uh, so kind to Jews. And one day I was standing in line at Blue Met and, and I said to somebody, you know, I said, I'm going to, to, to Czech Republic and to Germany. And she said, oh, well, you should get in touch with Anna Rasmus. And I said, well, I've always wanted to. And she turned around and tapped somebody on the shoulder. And she said, Gina wants to get in touch with Anna Rasmus. Do you have an email? It was like, just like that. And that's how I got invited. But I wrote to Anna and the first time. And I said, like you, I was born in Passau. But I was born while my parents were living in a DP camp. And um, my mother said that it was because there was a doctor who, you know, that there were too many babies dying. <laughs> she wrote back and said, oh, she must have heard about all the baby deaths in 46 and 47. I was born in January of 48. And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, oh, yes, there was, it wasn't a doctor. It was a midwife. And it was the American-run DP camp. They discovered that there was an inordinate number of babies who were dying at a very, you know, within the first week of their lives. Mothers had been through hell, so many of them believed it was because of what they'd been through. Turned out it was a midwife who was, when she had the babies, would press down on the fontanelle, which is, you know, the brain is still, the skull is still open, and that would kill the babies. And they had unearthed the graves of 57 babies in a farmer's field. So that's that's what Jane Houghton wanted to to track down. We never did find out who it was. It's a remarkable uh, documentary. Uh, what impact has COVID had on your writing? I live in the country and I, I sit in my office and it really didn't have that much of an impact. We, in March of, uh, of 2020, we were in Spain, uh, or actually we were in, in France, and that was a terrifying escape because from one day to the next, suddenly the town that we were in, Sitges, emptied of people, and um, that was the only impact, that frightening escape <laughs> From, from Europe, once we got home, it was just like, we don't go out to eat much. We, uh, Axel loves to cook. So uh, nothing, it, nothing was seriously changed except we didn't get to see our friends. And that, that, was, that was really hard. But uh, I was already accustomed to communicating via Skype and Zoom and so, not much. Now, you spent a lot of your life in the city, living in the center of town and the middle of town, and then now, now you've been living for quite a few years out in the countryside. Tell us about the, the two Ginas, the Gina who liked living in the heart of the city and the Gina who likes living in the country. 
Well, the Gina who, the, the thing that connected both Gina's is my love of trees. So when I was living in the city, I had to be near trees. Uh, even when I was living on Vine uh, near the canal, there was a tree, right? It, the reason I bought the, the condo was because there was a tree right outside the bedroom window. That was the first thing I would see when I woke up in the morning. And now I'm surrounded by trees. So that's the connection. Um, when, I, when I was a city girl, I had to be everywhere and do everything. And being a country girl came at a good time in my life because I've slowed down. And with COVID, that's really the, 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 one, the one saving grace of COVID was that um, I suddenly realized there was no rush to do anything. <laughs> And that was a very nice feeling. Um, I also, I felt like a lot of people who, a lot of writers, that you would think that that would be the ideal time to be writing up a storm. And yet nobody felt like doing anything. It was, you know, we had these conversations. Everybody was sort of like lethargic about writing. Maybe because we didn't have deadlines. We didn't know <laughs> what the car was bringing. <laughs> What's the... Uh, one piece of advice you'd have for anyone contemplating writing a memoir? Uh, I tell my memoirs at the beginning. Uh, first of all, you have to tell the truth. Stop worrying about what anybody's going to think. Um, you have to tell the truth. You can always adapt it, um, couch it, you know, fuzz it over at a later date. But if you're not going to tell the truth, and it, it becomes very um, obvious. You know, it it, it, it it turns the reader away from the story. It's the true parts that engage of other people. We always think we're the only ones. And yet every one of the things that so remarkable about working with these 14 women who are writing memoir is that they all come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different countries. Um, and yet there are connecting threads where everybody recognizes what is, they recognize the familiar. There are always those familiar threads because we're more alike than we're different. And if you don't tell the truth, what you're trying to do is build a house of cards and it will collapse. So tell the truth. What do, you, what do you like to read? What's on your bookshelf right now? Oh, the books of Jacob. I'm reading uh, the choir boy and the, um, and the choir boy and the uh, uh, belly dancer written by a friend of mine. Um, I have, um, I have uh, I have a stack like this. I don't remember the name. <laughs> I just don't have as, to get to them. <laughs> as as a child of uh, a survivor, how do you react to the horrors happening on a on a daily basis in Ukraine? It's it's terrifying, um, and I think I think it's affecting all of us, not just. Uh, those of us who've heard the stories, it's like, you know, um, let me put it this way. Years ago, I was part of a writing group. We were 10, 10 years together. It was an amazing group. I think I was the oldest one there. And of course, I was writing these kind of stories. And I, I kept apologizing to the, to the group who most of whom were not Jewish. Who, 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 these stories were really the stories that were about another time in another place. And when I, uh, I remember several of them said the same thing to me. Stop apologizing. These are amazing stories. They must, they must be told. And, you know, we need all these stories. And when I think about that, um, those of us who've been steeped in these stories, uh, it, it feels like deja vu. Well, you know, weren't we just here? Didn't we just go through this? How come we haven't learned anything? 
but um, it could be because we stopped telling the stories. One of the interesting things is, uh, I, I was reading a study that um, it's the third generation, it's the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who are getting the stories straight as opposed to what their parents received because mm -hmm. either the, you know, the parents couldn't deal with it or the, the, the grandparents didn't want to burden their children, but it's okay because one generation later can handle this. But one generation later can't stop what's going on now. Very true. Thank you very much, Gina. Now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dylan from Guernica to choose uh, some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing that beautiful reading and just the conversation flowing. I got a little bit emotional at some points, but that's on me. <laughs> okay, so um, for anybody who would like to ask questions, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. You can also put them in the chat box. Um, awesome. Okay. You hold the mic closer, perhaps. Or... Oh, sorry, everyone. Yeah, now we can hear you, yeah. Perfect. So if you can just leave your questions in the chat box and we will get right to them. There's some in the Q&A. No. Uh, Elisa says, Rockel wrote, I'm not her. Is it referring to Anya, Maria, Kelsey, the Polish girl? Why did Rockel need to reveal this to Hannah? Why did, uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Oh, sorry, that was um, from Elisa. Yes. Rockel wrote, I'm not her. Is it referring to Anya Marzia? Oh, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering that. Uh, Maria, the Polish girl, why did Rockel need to reveal this to Hannah? Um, I am not her refers to um, the woman that her cousin thought she was. That yes, she was that she was not this um, this helper for for um, for the Nazi uh, commandant. She wasn't what she appeared to be. And that's what she meant. I am not her. You, it really also means that I'm nothing of what you know of me. That uh, it's it's more than just about her her historical past, about her her time in Auschwitz. It's about all the things that she'd been through and that she could not share before. Thank you. They say deathbed, they, they say deathbed confessions are the, the truest. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Rachel Miller. There were so many themes, all important. How did you keep track and integrate them? It took me 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I had a lot of help from, from people who who were my beta readers, um, who went to uh, great lengths to, to point out disconnects and, and, and areas where they were confused. And so eventually, if you read it over often enough, you can catch the mistakes. I caught one just, just before it went to print, just before it went to print. So. <laughs> All right, I don't see any other questions, um, but if you have any last minute ones, feel free to pop them in. Okay. And I just wanna remind everyone, um, before we do say goodbye, um, that the link to purchase this book is available in the chat. It's on the Guernica website but you can also find it at local bookshops, libraries in Canada, the US and the UK. Um, and for those of you wondering, there'll be a, a recording of the event available on our YouTube channel. 
I also have a couple more questions um, from Diane. Was there a part of the book that was the most emotional for you to write? Um, I think the part that was most emotional was uh, Ruffle's story. Mm. Um, it, it was completely manufactured. I knew no one like that. So um, the more I wrote it, 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 it was almost like Ruffle came alive and channel, ch channeled herself into, the, into my psyche. Um, several people have told me that that's the most powerful part of the book for me. For, uh, for them, and I am uh, I'm enormously grateful for whatever muse mm -hmm. <laughs> stood on my shoulder while I was writing Rachel, because uh, I think she is uh, certainly the most powerful character mm -hmm. in, in the book. Jose asks, what's the most interesting um, fact you learned while doing research for the book? Um, about the female commandants in Auschwitz and and how their cruelty was was you know beyond any understanding. Um, uh, it, it was very it was very difficult. You know, to be writing these stories, you have to you have to understand having been there. But I wasn't there. And so you read a lot of accounts, but um, somehow that really, that, that troubled me. That, that was a hard part for me to write. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question from Eddie. Why did you decide to write it as fiction and not nonfiction? Because it's not my story. Mm -hmm. And this isn't something that happened to me. Um, and uh, I will write a memoir, but it won't be about this. <laughs> It'll be about my life. Not a, I, 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 I think that one of the things that I didn't write about my mother's life, because first of all, I didn't know enough about it. Uh, I've probably learned more about her life after her, after her death, may she rest in peace than I did while she was alive because I, I had perspective. And so uh, I didn't feel equipped to write. And I'm not a researcher, I'm a storyteller. And that's, I think sometimes I invented my own life. So <laughs> I'm not really capable of writing about somebody else's in a truthful way. Mm -hmm. Elise asks again, um, the romance between Hannah and Max is a little bit daring, don't you think? Especially it being a second generation survivor and a German. Well, it's not, it, it, it was necessary in order to examine both sides of the, the coin because there are the, the, the children of perpetrators are second generation as well. And how did they deal with it? And I've read a lot about um, about Germans and and how they have had to deal with what their parents had done or not done, and and the burdens that they feel. And my partner is German, and in learning about his his approach to life, he's very much a man of the moment. He lives in the moment. And you know, he's the one who said to me, I was born in 1949. What do I have? You know, what responsibility do I have? That's one of the things I wanted to explore. Well, I think that's all of our questions for now. Um, if you have any questions later on, feel free to reach out to Gina on any kind of social media, or if you want to um, comment in the survey at the end of the Zoom, um, you can definitely do that as well. Um, and we will relay those information. Um, but that's 
all for tonight. And I want to congratulate Tommy and Gina for such a beautiful conversation, such an eye-opening conversation. Um, and please purchase your book. Um, make sure you have a copy so you can get your hands on it and you can figure out all the twists and turns. So beautifully written. Uh, thank you so much for attending everybody and have a great rest of your night. Thank you, Dylan. You're welcome. Thank you.